Okay, we are now for our final session. Uh, our final session is going to look at um, the international trade issues. And um, we are going to begin with an afternoon keynote from, by Mr. Masakuzo Toyota. Uh, Mr. Toyota is the uh, chairman and CEO of the uh, Institute for Energy Economics of Japan. Uh, it's a great honor to welcome him here. We have been uh, collaborating with the IEEJ for 15 years. Uh, it is our most successful international collaboration to date, and uh, we have very much uh, enjoyed that collaboration in terms of its fruitfulness and helping us have an international perspective on issues that we might have viewed more parochially in an American way. And uh, if you don't not mind my saying so, it's uh, been some of my best meals ever anywhere in the world I've had in uh, Tokyo. Uh, with my friends from IEEJ, so it's always a pleasure to come and visit. Um, uh, Mr. Toyota comes with a very uh, suitable background to be keynoting today's conference. Um, he was, uh, he has been in many different agencies, uh, uh, beginning in 1975 in petroleum, later in alternative energy, uh, in both the Departments of Energy and Resource Agency, he has been with the International Energy Agency. Uh, he was involved in the International Trade Policy Bureau. Um, but uh, more recently, uh, he was uh, the advisor in uh, Sonpo, Japan, and special advisor to the cabinets on the Asian economy and climate change. And uh, he uh, comes with a uh, master's degree. He graduated from the University of Tokyo, but uh, I have to say this because even though we're here at Rice University and all my children are here and we're a great university, uh, he, like I, has a degree from Princeton. Uh, he holds a degree in public affairs from the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton. Mr. Toyota, please. Amy, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Um, my name is Toyoda, uh, not Toyota. Uh, no connection with the uh, Toyota family. I, I, I have to say that uh, before you ask me whether I am from a uh, rich Toyota family. Unfortunately, I'm not. Um, today, um, I'd like to uh, discuss some uh, policy uh, issue, uh, more uh, general issue, collaboration uh, between US and, and Japan uh, to accelerate uh, uh, negotiation on uh, climate change. Uh, basically, I'd like to discuss three uh, issues. Uh, one is uh, uh, present state of negotiations, uh, you already know this. Um, and, and, and in the morning, some uh, speakers explained, uh, but, but I like to uh, um, explain my own view on desirable uh, cooperative initiatives, that's one thing. And secondly, uh, what could be appropriate uh, reduction targets? I think this is very much controversial. And this is one of the reasons why uh, negotiation could not uh, uh, be concluded so uh, easily. And, and third, uh, uh, reductions by developing countries, uh, emission reduction by developing countries, how US and, and Japan can uh, cooperate uh, uh, with each, each other on, on this particular uh, issue. I don't know whether you could uh, read uh, um, uh, the, the sentences, but the first um, uh, uh, present state of uh, uh, negotiation, I don't have to go into details, uh, uh, already some speakers explained, but at this moment, uh, one important basis for negotiation is uh, uh, the Copenhagen, Copenhagen Accord, which was uh, agreed uh, by most countries uh, uh, last uh, December in, in Copenhagen but seemingly uh, um, 
major differences uh, uh, still remain um, among advanced emerging and, and developing uh, uh, countries. Um, and, and the fear is, is that seemingly this deviation is getting uh, larger uh, in recent uh, 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 months. Um, this is, uh, again, I don't know whether you could read, uh, but uh, these red circles, um, you could see some numbers uh, from the top, Japan, EU, US, Canada, and, and bottom, China and I India. And red circles uh, areas um, uh, indicate that uh, um, uh, respect countries registered to deduce how much by 2020, uh, how much deduction, uh, emission deduction can be made by those uh, uh, countries. Uh, there are various uh, numbers. Japan is saying 25% uh, uh, reductions, um, uh, but on the basis, uh, uh, on, on the premise that uh, uh, major economies uh, um, make uh, comparable uh, efforts, and the EU, uh, 20, 30%. Uh, again, they are saying uh, they are watching other, what other countries are doing, and, and US here, I, I use 4% um, uh, 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 numbers. Uh, uh, because 70% uh, uh, compared with 2005 um, is uh, essentially 4% compared to uh, 1990. In order to make an objective comparison, I use uh, this, this number. And, and going down to China and, and India, um, China uh, is uh, uh, trying to register uh, in terms of uh, uh, emission uh, efficiency rather than uh, absolute uh, uh, reduction uh, numbers. And they are saying 40%, uh, 45% uh, uh, improvement of uh, uh, emission um, uh, 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 efficiency, uh, but it means in, in the next uh, 10 years uh, uh, the emission would double uh, on uh, assuming uh, in assuming 8% uh, economic uh, growth or 8 or 9% economic growth uh, uh, continuing. Uh, India, um, similarly, uh, in terms of uh, emission intensity, 20%, 25% uh, uh, improvement. Again, uh, it means in the next uh, 10 years, they would double uh, emission um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, absolute, uh, absolute term. And, and, and that's... Uh, the, the situation, and, and um, um, it seems to me uh, um, U.S. Uh, um, has some problem in passing uh, a cap and trade bill before at least uh, before uh, the midterm election, and that would do make um, uh, the government difficult to attain that um, uh, goal, and, and also. Uh, uh, we understand China is quite reluctant to uh, make international commitment uh, to that number. Um, they are uh, uh, making uh, 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 the very best uh, uh, effort inside um, domestically, but, but they don't want to uh, uh, make a, a legally binding international commitment. And, and all countries um, are concerned with uh, uh, the impact uh, of uh, those commitments on uh, economic uh, uh, performance. Well, in a, in a sense, under uh, such a uh, difficult economic time, uh, uh, it is uh, quite, uh, quite understandable. And, and so that's why at the last uh, uh, sentence, as uh, um, Professor uh, Stavins said, uh, um, in Mexico, um, uh, we may not be uh, able to have meaningful um, uh, agreement. And, and so uh, the, the reason why um, the difficulty lie is, is that uh, the economic concern, um, the dead sharp uh, uh, upward uh, uh, trend, uh, uh, this is uh, the trend of um, uh, 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 emission, uh, uh, carbon dioxide emission by China. Um, in, in the past uh, um, uh, 
10 years, 15 years, their um, GDP became larger by four times, five times. And, 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 and um, they are very much concerned with uh, uh, the social impact of uh, 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 slower uh, economic growth. And, and so, uh, uh, again, it is uh, um, under understandable. So what shall we do? Um, as uh, uh, Amy introduced me, I was advisor to the cabinet on, on climate change. Um, at that time, I cannot uh, be free from um, 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 saying a party line, but now I am uh, uh, independent, and so I can say uh, whatever I want. And, and at this moment, um, I would uh, uh, say uh, that uh, U.S. and Japan should uh, uh, make efforts to um, have a, a sort of second best solution rather than uh, the first best uh, solution. A best solution, clearly, a uh, fair sharing of burden, and uh, particularly developed countries uh, should uh, be quite ambitious. Um, uh, 25 or 40 percent reduction by 2020, but that would affect um, uh, adversely on uh, economies. And, and then um, we have to be quite uh, realistic. And, and emerging economy, uh, similarly, they are very much concerned with the uh, economic uh, uh, impact. And so the second best solution uh, we could uh, uh, proceed our negotiations uh, on the basis of Copenhagen Accord. So uh, uh, the number, uh, these numbers, how we could uh, uh, make it uh, somehow comparable, um, it is uh, uh, not easy exercise, but uh, uh, since uh, um, uh, 40 countries uh, 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 register those numbers, uh, with uh, some range or with some conditions. Uh, uh, we think um, uh, we could uh, uh, find a uh, um, second best solution on the basis of uh, uh, this uh, 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 Copenhagen uh, code. Um, undesirable approach, um, um, uh, some of the speakers uh, 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 already uh, mentioned that uh, uh, here is a possibility in Mexico that uh, simple continuation of uh, the Kyoto Protocol, um, uh, that's uh, one option. But, but we think um, uh, it is uh, not uh, uh, a viable uh, option uh, because uh, the continuation of uh, uh, Kyoto Protocol, uh, this means only 20%, 28% of uh, uh, emission um, um, uh, 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 emitting uh, countries can be covered. Uh, U.S. and, and, and China, uh, which consist uh, uh, of 40% uh, of uh, uh, emissions uh, of, of the total, uh, they are outside uh, uh, the, the agreement. And, 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 and that would do, uh, is be a rather meaningless uh, uh, Framework. In addition to that, uh, um, uh, another reason is, is B, uh, which is um, um, uh, uh, damaging or, or harmful uh, to the efforts uh, of ours uh, because um, uh, simply uh, uh, factories of companies under the Kyoto Protocol would relocate their factory uh, to the countries outside uh, the agreement. Uh, because they can be free uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, uh, continue their, their emissions. And so this wouldn't uh, uh, be helpful uh, uh, for the global uh, uh, interest. So in this, uh, in this regard, uh, um, a desirable approach is uh, um, the second best approach. Uh, undesirable uh, approach uh, is simple continuation of uh, um, Kyoto uh, Protocol. And, and then um, the, the, the next question is uh, uh, what could be appropriate reduction uh, efforts by uh, 2020? As I explained to you uh, already, various countries uh, uh, register uh, different, uh, different numbers. Um, uh, how we could uh, make uh, uh, a sort of uh, uh, meaningful fair 
uh, uh, comparison, and, and, and that is a uh, uh, real uh, question at this uh, moment. And, and so um, uh, um, uh, here uh, uh, we have to think about uh, a sort of uh, uh, fair, uh, objective, uh, transparent um, um, uh, uh, framework. And, and uh, here uh, as a sort of comparison among three uh, uh, big economies, uh, developed countries, Japan, the EU, uh, US, um, and, and the upper part uh, uh, is showing um, marginal cost for each country uh, when uh, 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 respective countries reduce their emissions by 10%, 20%, and, and 25%, uh, sorry, 10, 15, 25%. And, and, and the lower part um, uh, is at, uh, trying to uh, show uh, 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 a sort of uh, a comparable uh, reduction uh, uh, to uh, Japan um, uh, by EU and, and US on the basis of uh, uh, this marginal uh, cost. When Japan is insisting 25% uh, reduction is must, and, 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 and then uh, the, the marginal cost of Japan is uh, higher than $400, uh, uh, dollars. and EU, US uh, uh, in the range of um, uh, $100 and $160. Uh, dollars. And, and, and so uh, in order to make a, a comparable uh, efforts, uh, at least uh, Japan could uh, uh, reduce up to uh, 10%. But still, um, uh, the abatement cost for uh, Japan is, is uh, much, much higher. And, and when uh, Japan uh, 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 commit a 10% reduction by 2020, uh, comparable reduction could be uh, 28 for EU or 26 uh, for US. And so th this is one um, uh, picture of comparable uh, framework. Uh, but um, um, abatement cost, marginal abatement cost is only one indicator of fairness. And, and, and uh, um, IEA or other uh, uh, international organization or, um, 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 uh, also making similar efforts to uh, 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 show uh, what is uh, uh, comparable uh, 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 framework. Um, the, the top uh, line is uh, showing uh, what IEA, International Energy Agency, is saying uh, when Japan uh, 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 makes commitment to 10% reduction, uh, EU could be 23, US could be uh, 3%. Um, they um, uh, are taking into consideration not only abatement cost, but also uh, uh, physical condition, how large countries um, uh, are, and also um, uh, 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 emission per GDP, et cetera, et cetera. And um, um, uh, the third line uh, uh, is also interesting. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, uh, Dutch uh, uh, agency. Uh, they are uh, showing similar uh, comparison and, and, and when Japan uh, makes uh, um, a commitment to uh, 5 to 10 percent range, uh, EU um, uh, 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 comparable number uh, could be 30, uh, 40 range and US uh, 10, or, uh, 10 to 20 uh, percent range. And, and so this is uh, um, uh, providing us uh, uh, a rough uh, 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 picture of uh, 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 comparable uh, 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 fair or uh, equitable uh, framework. And so when we say uh, um, uh, the second best approach, um, we registered a lot of numbers, uh, different numbers, but, but somehow uh, we could uh, 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 understand each other and, and try to uh, have um, a, a sort of uh, uh, comparable numbers on the basis of uh, various uh, uh, indicators. Why um, Japanese abatement cost is so high? Uh, 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 this is uh, uh, showing uh, the reason uh, for that. Uh, this is uh, uh, indicating that carbon intensity on, on, on the left-hand side and, and energy intensity on, on, on the right-hand side. And, and uh, the, um, the, the the right-hand side, I'm sorry, the left, 
left-hand side, uh, yellow line is showing um, uh, carbon intensity or energy intensity of, of Japan. And EU, uh, Canada, Australia, uh, seemingly US is, is uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, not indicated, but, but the third one from uh, uh, the left uh, is it's US. Uh, so um, here are a, a lot of differences in terms of carbon intensity. And, and from uh, 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 the left, uh, the highest bar uh, is showing Russia and then China and, and India. Uh, compared with Japan, uh, Chinese uh, intensity uh, is uh, 10 times uh, uh, worse, and, and uh, uh, India, the third one from the, the left, uh, from the right, uh, is showing that uh, eight uh, uh, times uh, worse uh, than Japan. But, but this means um, uh, in China or, or India, uh, there is a, a huge room for them to uh, uh, improve uh, uh, their intensity if, if uh, uh, technology can be uh, transferred and, and uh, good finance uh, uh, is uh, uh, made uh, 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 to realize uh, those uh, uh, improvement of uh, intensity. Um, I would uh, turn my uh, discussion to the um, uh, economic impact of uh, uh, emission reduction uh, efforts. Uh, this is uh, the case uh, of, of Japan. Uh, when uh, uh, we make 10% um, uh, 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 emission reduction, uh, it would uh, uh, reduce uh, GDP uh, by 1.2% uh, over the next 10, 10 years. And number of unemployed uh, would uh, uh, increase by 290,000. Uh, and, and, and if you uh, uh, look at the, uh, the right-hand side, uh, uh, when we make a 25% uh, uh, emission reduction, uh, clearly uh, uh, the impact on GDP, uh, uh, negative impact on GDP is larger, and number of employed uh, 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 people uh, uh, would be much, much uh, larger. Um, similar, um, Analysis was made by EU and US uh, uh, and other, other countries, uh, and, and uh, uh, the impact uh, uh, is uh, uh, more or less uh, uh, the same. At least uh, all countries are showing that uh, uh, efforts to reduce uh, um, uh, carbon dioxide emission uh, would uh, have uh, uh, negative uh, impact. And then, um, uh, is this bad for us with this uh, um, um, uh, not acceptable uh, uh, to all of us. Um, I, uh, we would think um, um, uh, here are uh, good aspects of uh, making efforts to reduce uh, um, uh, uh, emissions. Uh, this, these are uh, three examples. Uh, um, by uh, promoting uh, uh, measures uh, to combat the climate change, um, uh, we could do uh, 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 expand a uh, new market uh, for environmental uh, friendly uh, goods. Um, if uh, uh, first, if uh, we can export, this is in the case of Japan, uh, of energy or environmental uh, technologies and, and gaining five or 10% uh, share of global market that would do uh, a boost GDP growth by uh, 0.9 or 1.8%. Uh, um, so, uh, um, environmental goods, if uh, the market is expanded and, and, and US, EU, and, and Japan can take a uh, considerable share of that, uh, uh, then that would do, uh, uh, boost the economy. And, and so, uh, the, the issue is uh, um, um, uh, uh, how we could do, uh, minimize uh, the negative economic impact. Uh, of uh, uh, emission reduction efforts by uh, 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 expanding uh, uh, new market. And, and so uh, uh, trade negotiation on uh, 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 trade uh, tariff elimination of economic, uh, 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 sorry, uh, 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 eco-friendly uh, uh, goods uh, is quite in 
important in that regard. And the, the second one is uh, um, if we can lower somehow uh, crude oil prices uh, uh, by international coordinated efforts, and, and then again it would uh, affect positively uh, the economies. Um, uh, for, for instance, the, the, the third one, uh, consumption reduced worldwide uh, uh, by um, uh, trying to uh, uh, promote uh, uh, energy conservation, etc., etc., then 0.7% um, uh, higher GDP growth. And, and so uh, um, we could uh, make um, a sort of coordinated efforts uh, to compensate for negative impact of uh, emission uh, reduction um, um, uh, efforts. And, and so sometimes, uh, uh, clearly, um, uh, efforts to combat uh, um, uh, climate change uh, 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 is uh, contradicting with uh, uh, economic growth, but, but uh, if we can uh, have a, a good time frame and if we can have a, a good uh, 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 policies, uh, then we could somehow um, uh, compensate for the negative impact and make it uh, uh, more uh, positive uh, uh, contribution to, to the economy. Accelerated innovations, as the third one, unfortunately it takes time and, and so uh, it wouldn't uh, uh, have an immediate uh, 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 impact on, on, on this. Uh, actually, this is a market uh, which we understand uh, from the top nuclear uh, market, uh, photovoltaic uh, uh, market, uh, wind power, etc., etc. Uh, the biggest market uh, is uh, economic vehicle, and so uh, uh, this economic vehicle uh, is quite important area for us to boost uh, our economies. Uh, clearly, uh, competition will be severe, but um, uh, if it is a sound competition, uh, we welcome uh, that. And, and me. Uh, uh, turn to um, uh, what uh, um, uh, we are suggesting to the Japanese government. Um, first, uh, second best uh, approach um, uh, should be uh, uh, cooperated with, with the United States. And, and secondly, uh, for domestic uh, um, um, uh, uh, reduction, uh, we could have uh, more, uh, um, uh, much bolder uh, efforts. Uh, actually, um, uh, Japanese cabinet uh, 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 approved 30% uh, reduction by 2030 uh, without any purchases uh, or permits from abroad. Um, this is also a high um, uh, uh, ambitious um, target, uh, but, but uh, in order to uh, encourage our investors uh, to make uh, continuous efforts. Uh, we uh, tend to think uh, um, domestically we should have such an uh, 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 ambitious target. I understand the uh, uh, US government has similar uh, target, uh, uh, um, uh, regardless of uh, uh, the uh, strength of its uh, uh, commitment. And, and, and uh, this is a um, uh, 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 more detailed explanation, but, but tomorrow uh, my colleague um, uh, Kobayashi-san is going to explain about that. And, and so let me um, uh, skip uh, 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 the explanation of uh, those uh, 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 detailed um, 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 a part of, of, of our target. But uh, this, this chart is, is showing a long-term um, uh, uh, trajectory. Um, by 2050, uh, developed countries are supposed to uh, 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 reduce our emissions by, say, 80% um, 80, 80 uh, compared from uh, 1990 or uh, 2005 level. Um, and and uh, when we um, take 10% um, uh, 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 reduction in 2020 instead of 25% uh, reduction, um, there will be a deviation. Uh, but um, um, if we go back to 30% uh, um, uh, reduction uh, by uh, 2030, uh, the deviation can be uh, somehow uh, restored. And, and so we could do uh, continue, continue to make uh, 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 
uh, reduction uh, down to um, uh, 2050. And, and so uh, at this moment, uh, uh, the important thing is whether or not uh, our readers uh, of the world, particularly US and, and, and Japan, can share this sort of uh, long-term trajectory uh, to uh, 25, uh, uh, 2050. Um, uh, the year 2050. Unless uh, uh, readers share this sort of long-term uh, trajectory, um, negotiators would fight against each other. I think uh, it's, it's uh, um, not quite uh, uh, productive. Uh, 2020 is only a, a, a passing point toward um, uh, 2050. And, and as everybody knows, uh, our technological development uh, takes time, and, and, and 2020 is just there. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, new uh, technology um, by, by then. Um, uh, lastly, um, I would like to touch upon um, uh, how U.S. and Japan can help uh, uh, developing countries uh, uh, reduce uh, uh, their, their emissions. Um, by 2012, uh, already U.S., uh, 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 Japan, EU uh, uh, made announcement how much uh, uh, financial assistance can, can be made. Um, uh, uh, Japan uh, is saying that uh, uh, 15 billion dollars um, uh, uh, aid uh, uh, can be provided. Uh, a similar uh, announcement is made by US and, and, and EU. And, and, and the next question is uh, um, what we can do uh, with respect to uh, 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 assistance uh, toward the 2020. Uh, this is uh, quite uh, controversial. Uh, the representative of leaders get together and they discuss this issue, uh, but, but this is not easy because unless uh, uh, developing countries make meaningful commitment, uh, uh, any country, any developed countries is ready to help them. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not easy. So we have to go back to the first question. Uh, 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 the important thing is uh, uh, we try to have a sort of second best solution. Unless uh, we can do that, um, uh, uh, we uh, cannot make um, uh, 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 any meaning uh, uh, progress. Uh, in, in conclusion, um, uh, there are uh, 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 a big potential uh, uh, of cooperation between US and, 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 and Japan to accelerate the negotiation. Uh, and, and try to uh, establish comparable, uh, uh, fair, uh, equitable uh, framework. A and also, um, uh, uh, we can help uh, developing countries uh, 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 go ahead. Um, um, we clearly have to have EU uh, with us, um, but uh, um, at this moment, uh, um, EU is still um, uh, seemingly sticking to the first best approach. Um, and, 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 and then, uh, first, uh, uh, what we should do is uh, US and, and Japan to cooperate, to seek uh, uh, the second best approach, and then uh, encourage EU to get on board. And, and then we could uh, dissolve the whole things uh, 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 as far as 2020 uh, uh, issue is concerned. And, and, and then uh, we should go down up to uh, 20. Uh, 50. I, I think uh, 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 um, uh, this uh, 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 conference by, hosted by uh, Baker Institute and, and our collaboration uh, uh, with uh, Baker Institute uh, could do, uh, uh, form such a uh, 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 consensus for us to encourage two governments uh, to uh, take a, a meaningful initiative uh, to uh, the successful negotiation. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, now we will have our uh, final session. Um, I am next, and I have uh, spent uh, some time with my uh, co-researcher, Jarera Lass, who uh, a few of you in the room might remember that Jarir used to write about OPEC with me when we were both journalists. 
Um, and so we have gone back and looked at the history of US-OPEC relations. Uh, it was a very interesting exercise uh, to go back and read the memoirs of uh, Nixon and uh, Kissinger talking about the crises in the 70s and then to read the speeches of Jimmy Carter and so forth. Um, it was a little bit daunting to see how um, much of the rhetoric that we hear today in the US political arena has not really actually changed all that much. Um, I did make an effort. Let's see if I brought my piece of paper. Uh, I did make an effort. Uh, Peter Hartley always helps me do this calculation. Uh, when people propose that we should do something, um, it always sounds very nice until you consider the scale of what you're suggesting. Um, and I find that the public has trouble thinking in scale. If I tell you how many BTUs or how many megawatts or how many terawatts or how many barrels of oil equivalent uh, and you're my mother, um, it means nothing to you. Um, so I try to turn everything into nuclear plants uh, because I feel that all Americans can understand how long it takes to build a nuclear plant and how many different places we would want to put one. Uh, so if we were to try to replace in our so-called goal of energy independence, uh, all U.S. imports, current U.S. imports, uh, with nuclear energy, it would take us eight times the current installed capacity we have in the United States if it were to run 24 hours a day. So I uh, start my paper and my presentation um, with that in mind. Uh, that is a interesting fact to tell, um, but I'm going to be even more controversial, and so my apologies to our friends from OPEC that are here today, uh, because I want to start with a provocative slide. Because I think the international community moving forward with the membership of the G20 and with the challenges that are going to face the global economy and just face the global economy uh, in 2007 and 2008, which affected everyone, and not just consuming countries, but also producing countries. I just want to show this chart. And I don't show this chart to propose that the United States should do something about food supply. Um, I just show this chart as a hey wow. Here is the hey wow. Here is the monopoly that basically five countries have on the production of food. The concentration of production and export and food in the world is incredibly small. And it would never be acceptable, ever, for these five countries to have a meeting and talk about how much food we were going to produce and what the fair price for that food would be. And if you go back in Henry Kissinger's memoirs and read about the Ford years, you can actually see the discussion that happened in the US government about the fact that cartels were forming in different commodities and what was the United States going to do about food. True story. Something that sort of bypasses us when we think about the 70s in history. And let me show you, oh, well, I'm missing a slide. Hold on. Am I totally missing a slide? Oh, no. OK. So this is the concentration in oil in terms of resources. Um, this is the concentration of oil in terms of uh, oil supply. And we asked the question, is oil supply really any more geographically concentrated than food supply? And this is this chart that uh, was presented at a program we were having at the Baker Institute on biofuels. And the interesting question about biofuels, the professor who put together this work, uh, Professor Zender from Switzerland, uh, was trying to make the point that um, given the amount of water it takes to uh, grow grain for meat, and given the fact that the American habit of eating meat was becoming globally uh, normal, more culturally acceptable across the globe, especially in places like China, high population countries. Um, he started to talk about places that were going to become more and more scarce for their own domestic food production and were going to have to import more and more food over time. 
And then he showed the countries that would be left being able to make enough food that they could possibly export. And I found the presentation interesting. I mean, his point was we couldn't actually really afford to take arable land, produce crop on it, and turn that into fuel. And ultimately, I think that's correct. Um, but I think one has to stop in thinking about uh, energy, similar kind of map, uh, for who is going to, how we use energy, and what countries are unable to have uh, sufficient uh, fuel for their populations to be moving out of poverty um, over the next 20 years. I think we have to ask ourselves, is the international diplomatic system that we have today on energy and the dialogue we have between producers and consumers and the international architecture and framework that we have on the discussion between consumers and producers, is it really constructive enough? And are we really in, should we really ever have zero-sum conversations? And when we think about having zero-sum conversations, I don't show the food chart to imply that somehow anybody should have a zero-sum conversation about food because that would be totally immoral. I just show that chart to open people's thought waves about why we have, for the past 50 years, had a zero-sum dialogue on something that's also vital to the prosperity and the well-being of people, which is fuel. The ability to have heat and light, the ability to do work assisted by machines. And so with that, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. Why does the international community accept oil should be treated differently than other scarce commodities? Do oil producing countries really win in the long run from withholding oil capacity investment? What lessons can we learn from the history of US OPEC relations? What are we doing now that's working? What else could we do? And uh, I have this chart, it's from my book, Oil Dollars, Debt and Crisis, which I wrote with my co-author, uh, Mahmoud al-Gamal. Um, and in case anybody is wondering uh, whether or not uh, we take in this case just the case of Saudi Arabia as an illustration, whether or not the Saudi population is so-called quote-unquote winning from a zero-sum approach, and you see the pathway of per capita income in the United States, even though we keep having these financial crashes and recessions when there's oil shortages and crises in commodities, and even though Saudi Arabia gets the benefit of very, very high revenues when the price of oil bubbles up in a speculative furor for two years, five years, six years, uh, as you can see in per capita income terms, Saudi Arabia is not winning. And neither really is the United States because our line would be higher too, right? And so I asked the question, does the current way we all think about this commodity and how we organize the international dialogue on this commodity, is it really working? Um, so, uh, so we conclude in the paper, uh, competitive strategies where oil producers seek the highest possible oil prices and the United States seeks, seeks the lowest possible oil prices have not just been zero sum, but ultimately negative for all concerned. And uh, we have a lot of new potential today. Uh, we have the G20. We have the possibility of other bilateral or multilateral institutions or diplomatic um, uh, resources at our disposal to talk about this issue, which we don't do. Uh, interestingly, uh, during Kissinger's period, he created uh, these economic development commissions to help there be a orderly uh, recycling of petrodollar uh, wealth that came to both to the benefit of the global economy and to the benefit of the populations in the Middle East. Um, and uh, I think this is an interesting question. 
which uh, Dr. Al Gamal can talk about at greater length and with greater authority than I can about whether the sovereign wealth funds and others should be investing counter cyclically. Uh, whether the United States really benefits from talking about energy independence or whether that's empty words. Um, and what is it exactly uh, that we should be talking about um, in our multinational diplomacy about ensuring that enough investment is made in future oil and natural gas capacity. A uh, little bit of hindsight from history. Uh, here are all the things that had unintended consequences that turned out negatively for the United States over the 30-year period we looked at, or actually maybe 50-year period we looked at. Uh, price controls didn't work. Import controls didn't work. 1970s, regulatory limits on how much natural gas could be used in power generation created a crisis of shortages for years and years. Uh, declaring the, more recently, uh, declaring the United States won't use the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, not a good end result in the uh, speculative bubble in markets. Uh, protecting the coal industry hasn't produced uh, any more energy security or lowered our uh, growth in oil imports. Uh, setting targets for energy independence that are 50 years away, that's something we should certainly stop doing. Uh, Spending billions of dollars on a single uneconomic un alternative energy source because somebody thinks it's a good idea. Um, other things that happened over the period that we studied, uh, regulating environmentally the complete shutdown of any one possible major energy source instead of finding a technical solution to the environmental externality, uh, and also bowing to resource nationalism instead of seeking a strategic response. Um, benefits in high sight, automobile mileage standards, improvements to efficiency, so forth. Good, good results we've seen over time. International diplomacy, good results. We've had excellent cooperation uh, in the use of strategic stocks and cooperation with our, our allies in the Gulf uh, in, in um, modulate, modulating crises as they appear. Uh, in the international market. We saw that in 1990. We saw that in 2003. Uh, we have seen that on numerous occasions, that when the United States and the EU comes and has a dialogue with the OPEC countries about what is the appropriate use of strategic stocks versus the appropriate use of spare capacity, that the damage to the international economy has been much smaller uh, than when we didn't have that dialogue. And um, uh, this one's very unpopular, a little too libertarian, I'm sure, but uh, we should let prices stimulate energy efficiency in new drilling. Uh, in today's world, that's a politically incorrect thing to say, uh, but if you look over the history of 50 years, uh, it has been the lesson. And uh, it's, I would tell you it's the lesson of shale gas uh, that, the $15 per million BTU peak price in natural gas in the United States went a really long way to identifying new resources. Do I have another slide? No, that's it. So uh, I thank you for that. And uh, we have a couple questions or comments. I know that was a little controversial, so I thought I'd give the audience a minute to pause and breathe and see if anybody has a question. Uh, the paper has a lot more detail um, about how these things happened in history, what we did about them, and whether it turned negative or positive. So I encourage those of you who like to look backwards to read backwards and then realize how not too much has changed. Okay. All right. You are a very quiet crowd this afternoon. Okay. It's my great honor now. Um, to introduce my colleague, Robert Harris. Uh, Robert Harris is a premier um, scientist and uh, policy researcher. Uh, we're lucky to have him here in Houston. He is currently serving as the president and CEO of the Houston Advanced Research Center. Uh, he is also an adjunct professor of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Houston, um, and he has some other uh, local affiliations with Texas A&M. 
Um, he provo his professional interests focus on sustainability, science, engineering, education, and policy. He is a former senior scientist and director of the Institute for the Study of Society and the Environment at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. He is a very respected uh, geochemist internationally. And uh, I get to say that extra, extra, because his PhD is from Rice. Very good, Bob. I still uh, love every minute that I spend on the RISE campus. I had a fantastic uh, graduate uh, program here and uh, set me off on a career that's been exciting for uh, uh, every day and every minute. I want to uh, talk today about some accounting that's uh, of the geochemical variety. And it's actually a lot like uh, the work we've heard this morning by economists, only we're tracking uh, molecules and atoms around the planet and trying to use those measurements to make models and try to understand uh, what the scenarios for our future are in terms of things like uh, climate change. Probably the uh, simplest uh, graph of all and the one that we see over and over and over again is this uh, graph showing the growth of carbon dioxide in the global atmosphere over time, I've just taken uh, two decades here to illustrate the several things. Uh, the concentrations uh, and amounts of carbon dioxide in the global atmosphere were increasing at a relatively low, gra uh, low rate for a number of decades. From 1990 to 2000, you can see it was a period in which we were having a growth rate of uh, around 1% per year, and then beginning in 2000, we see a, a definite acceleration. And I think uh, some of the discussions this morning point to the reasons for that uh, with the uh, economic progress that was being made, especially in uh, East and South Asia. But uh, it was a pretty, pretty amazing acceleration, 3.4% per year, and that resulted in 2008, which is the last year that we've got formal international agreement on uh, emissions and concentrations uh, of carbon dioxide around the planet. In 2008, we had 8.7 picograms carbon. That's billion. So we have 8.7 billion metric tons. That's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. And uh, if you compare it to 1990, we have increased the amount by 41%. So that's pretty dramatic. And, and before I, I leave this diagram, I'd like to tell a quick story. We owe our science of looking at the carbon cycle on our planet to a graduate student from Scripps Institute of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego. Charles Keeling, when he was doing his doctoral work in chemistry, went into his faculty and said, I'd like to measure carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. And they looked at him and said, why would you want to do that? It's not reactive. It's not very interesting from a chemical perspective. And uh, Charles Keeling was really interested in, in the fact that he had learned from one of his mentors that there might be a way that you could use the CO2 to look at the metabolism of the Earth, sort of like the big, biggest organism we've got to deal with, the whole planet Earth. And that, that uh, really interested him, but it turned out you needed to have an incredibly precise measurement of carbon dioxide, orders of magnitude more accurate and precise than any measurements that had ever, ever been made because the annual change is still a very, very small increment over time in CO2. And in that era in the 60s when he was doing his uh, PhD, nobody had ever made measurements that accurate and precise. Uh, well, needless to say, uh, Charles Keeling became very famous because he, he did create uh, 
a, uh, a new capability for very high accuracy and precision in measuring CO2 on top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii. That station still runs today, and uh, it's all now extended globally over many sites around the planet, uh, and it's operated by uh, NOAA. And other nations have done the same, have put out networks, uh, Japan, Russia, Germany, everyone now is uh, participating in trying to improve our global measurements, all due to uh, a graduate student who is very clever and insightful. This is a uh, depiction of uh, taking and decomposing the emissions uh, into two categories, making it a little more uh, easily uh, uh, decomposed than to try to break it up into many nations. And so we've got the Annex B Kyoto Protocol nations, the developed nations who are participating. And you can see uh, that the emissions, uh, again, in billions of uh, tons per year, have been relatively constant over the uh, period shown here from 1990 to 2008, but we see what I think we would all intuitively expect, and that is that uh, most of the acceleration in the growth has come, as uh, mentioned earlier, in the developing countries. I got interested in that uh, issue back in the early 2000s when I was working with my colleague, uh, Dr. Shui Bin, who uh, uh, suggested uh, to me that she had just come from working at the Institute of Energy in Beijing. She suggested to me, she said, uh, Bob, she said, you know, there's just a lot of people out there beginning to really use more energy in China. And so we got very interested in that and, and decided to look at what the consequences of that might be in terms of the underlying processes that were driving that ramping up of manufacturing. And we used a uh, tool called a life cycle assessment, which is in my paper, but I don't have time to explain here, to try to decompose the, the carbon dioxide data back into the original consumption of materials that required energy that resulted in the CO2 emissions. So it was try to, trying to understand that carbon cycle through its entire uh, uh, beginnings in, uh, in nature and then going into the manufacturing process, utilization, and then uh, ultimate disposal. And the total life cycle gives you some sense of what's driving these, uh, these growth curves you're seeing. Now, I think uh, it's been widely uh, discussed in the media that we have uh, seen a most dramatic, dramatic and incredible uh, increase in the, uh, uh, from China in terms of its growth rate, but uh, it's also important to notice that India has now passed Russia, so the uh, top emitters are China, USA, and India. And uh, so I think we're seeing, uh, seeing something that's going to continue to unfold on us uh, as we go further uh, along. This is a uh, first insight into how you can begin to link those carbon emissions back into the issue of international trade. And uh, I find these statistics also uh, quite interesting. They come from the World Bank uh, Development Indicators. And uh, we start uh, at the bottom with population, and then we have uh, CO2 emissions, energy production, GDP, and the red curve, or red brownish curve, is trade, international trade. Globalization is really cranking, and uh, so there's a, a dramatic increase in the amount of materials flowing around the planet. Now, all those materials, you track them back, came from some mining in a particular country, and then a manufacturing process, and then a transport process, a use and consumption and uh, ultimate disposal. And so I want to follow all these uh, various commodities as they're moving around the planet and try to allocate carbon to the various steps along that life cycle of a, of a particular group of products. So what we do when we start to take that track of looking at the cycle and allocating 
the carbon to its various parts of the cycle is we shift from a production-based accounting where, where you're trying to do an inventory of emissions based on territory. And that's the way the UNFCC, the Kyoto Protocol, there's been for a very long time an agreement that we would use national inventories. And so you were responsible for those emissions that were essentially emitted on your turf, on your territory. There has been, uh, since uh, the early 2000s, uh, a group of people in, in a number of institutions, actually it's still a small group of people, who decided that it would be interesting to do what we call consumption-based accounting, which is what I alluded to a minute ago, using life cycle assessment modeling. And that the reason we thought for, that it would be uh, important for us to do that is it then looks back at issues like the ultimate responsibility of the consumer. And uh, I think in the long run, it's going to be very important in terms of dealing with uh, equity issues uh, in the climate uh, negotiation process. So here's the, uh, on, on the left-hand side is the uh, diagram you've already seen. And on the right-hand side, what you see is taking the component of carbon dioxide that's associated with that international trade and allocating it to the consumer. So it shifts the burden of the CO2 from the producer nation, which was part of the uh, acceleration of China and other India and other nations that are rapidly growing, and said, well, all of those commodities that were manufactured in China or India or, or other rapidly growing developing countries, actually the, the most materials were then shipped and consumed elsewhere, in the United States, for example, quite a, a lot of them. And that added up to a rather surprising number to a lot of people, that 25% of the growth that was previously assumed to be the responsibility of the developing nations might in some way be better allocated to the consuming nations, the developed nations. So that number is fairly large and it's growing fast. So it raises questions about uh, this production versus consumption. Uh, they're not very well, this, this set of issues is not uh, very well uh, uh, entertained by the ongoing process because of the fact that uh, you would have to get an agreement now across all nations for the methodologies, how they're to be uh, uh, utilized in each country, and uh, the data is somewhat limiting to do life cycle assessment in terms of the way in which trade is reported. Various types of items are bundled together, and there are a lot of assumptions that had to be, have to be made, but it's serious, it's serious enough at this point that I think it will get further consideration. This is a map from the most recent global assessment that has been done on this uh, topic by uh, Stephen Davis and Ken Caldera from Stanford University, published uh, uh, in 2010. And uh, these are the top uh, transport routes of uh, carbon that's flowing in materials that are being exported and imported. I'm going to leave this up here a few minutes and try to talk you through a little bit of this. Uh, the key factors is uh, key factor here is that you're looking only at the top nations, the top exporting and importing, to keep it somewhat uh, understandable. And you can see certainly the uh, very large exports from China going over to the United States, 395 million metric tons of carbon per year. And what that means is the carbon, the CO2, was emitted in China, but we're attributing it by embodying it in a virtual way in the, in the goods that go to the U.S. where they get consumed. So uh, that's what this, this term embodied carbon reflects the fact that those emissions that were created during the manufacturing are attributed to the commodity that's going to be consumed in another country. Sometimes it's called embedded carbon. It's also called virtual carbon but uh, embodied carbon is the most common, commonly used phrase for it. 
So that's, uh, that's one of the big uh, transport paths there. And, and it basically, as you can see, it's following uh, the uh, uh, pathways you'd expect to, uh, Eastern, to uh, the European Union, to Japan, and uh, those, are the com those are the countries that are the major sinks for uh, these consuming, uh, these items that are consumed and therefore uh, we would suggest that that's a, a very important uh, thing to quantify. And so this, this process of quantification is uh, going on in, uh, somewhat uh, in the U.S. There's a major leading group in Norway, uh, group in Japan. So it's starting to spread, and uh, we're beginning to gain, gain a community around this and uh, get some protocols so that everybody can agree upon uh, the methodologies just like Keeling had to do back in the 60s and 70s. There are certainly many people in the audience who could explain uh, uh, this part of uh, the issue uh, better than I can. We certainly see the uh, importance of embodied carbon is uh, related to the fact that there is some relocation of industries to countries with uh, less strict environmental regulations, although certainly the most dominant factor is uh, the fact that people are seeking lower production cost and to be in areas where there's really rapidly growing demand. So it makes a lot of uh, economic sense to see a lot of this manufacturing moving to uh, Asia. Conclusions that uh, I arrived to uh, at this early stage of this uh, consumption-based uh, approach to accounting for carbon is that uh, certainly it is increasing and it will continue to do so. Embodied carbon will, will continue to embodied CO2 will continue to be a very important uh, metric to uh, try to understand. That it's certainly captured the attention of uh, colleagues in uh, China and other countries, and uh, they have been speaking out uh, in Copenhagen and will continue to speak out that the uh, global agreements on emission reductions uh, must, considered, must consider shared responsibility between producers and consumers. And I, I don't think that they'll back off of that, and I support their, their, uh, their concern and I uh, think it's a, a very important uh, item to have on the agenda in Cancun and uh, off into the uh, future. Uh, there are many things b besides CO2 that we should be paying attention to in terms of climate negotiations. It's always the one that gets talked about, but uh, there are other carbon compounds like methane and black carbon, which actually could bring much more near-term uh, mitigation benefit uh, than carbon dioxide. And then there, in all of this transport, this global transport, in, import, export, transport of commodities, we're also transporting a lot of other things, nitrogen, uh, there's embedded water when you have food being shipped around the planet. So I, I think that in terms of not only climate, but thinking about uh, the design of more sustainable futures, we're going to see many other applications of uh, these methodologies uh, in terms of trying to figure out the best way to move forward uh, on our planet and uh, sustain uh, the resources that we do have for the nine billion people that we will need to uh, care for in the future. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Any, any questions? Thank you. Oh, good, good. Sorry, it's a long walk for a very short question. I'm Pierre Cranchon, I'm the French consul here. I was just wondering whether you had uh, thoughts on how in practice you could go about sharing that responsibility between producer and consumers of CO2. Well, the, the initial uh, thought is, is that if the methodologies are considered quantitative, if we can gain agreement that the, that, and everybody can sign on to that, that then the, the methodology for allocating that would be to allocate uh, 
according to the cycle of the commodity, the carbon to, for example, let me use an example, China-U.S. trade. You would take those CO2 emissions that were emitted during manufacturing of the commodity in China, but consumption in the U.S., those would be then put in the U.S. basket. It would be moved over there. It's more difficult for some aspects, although they're much less important than the manufacturing emissions, but for the, the original resources that went into doing the manufacturing, quite often then you have to track back. They don't all come from China. Some come from South Africa, some come from other areas, Australia, for example. So you would, you would have a, a web of those, and allocating that will be more controversial, as will the transport, sea transport, because uh, even today in the Kyoto Protocol and UNFCC, they have not decided how they can deal with the transport by air or by ships because they're going to so many different locations and it's very difficult to keep track of all of the bunker fuel that's being bought in different ports. But those are small items. The real big items are the uh, manufacturing and I think that one can be done quantitatively. So I have a question because I have the benefit of having read the paper. Could you talk for a moment about this issue uh, that I think does come up as part of it. Um, there is this momentum in the United States gaining great favor uh, that we need to be a first mover in clean technologies so that we grab that market and have economic strength. And I'm sure perhaps there's a dialogue about that in Japan, and there's certainly a dialogue about that in China. Um, but that sort of implies a protectionist trade policy where I want to keep that, the patents and the technology is mine, whatever country it is that's developed it. Uh, but in the paper you discussed, especially in the case of this embedded carbon, that as part of an international agreement, uh, the World Bank and others have done some studies about the benefits of actually proliferating uh, all technologies. I wonder if you could comment on that for a minute. I'd be glad to, yeah. I, I was quite uh, enthusiastic about some of those uh, initial discussions, and uh, much of that also goes back to Mr. Toyota's uh, uh, discussion about the U.S. and Japan getting together and beginning to think about how the uh, development of innovation in some of these clean technologies might be used as part of a negotiation process for countries that do have very high carbon intensity, for example, like China. Uh, and uh, so one might assume that you could have a negotiation over having agreements about the IP, the intellectual property of these, being shared, and then you would get some benefit from that in terms of uh, your uh, carbon accounting. But uh, the first big step is to, I think, uh, try to follow uh, the line of discussion that uh, Mr. Toyota uh, suggested and get several of the industrial countries uh, or, or developed wealthy countries to really sit down and think about how we could do that because obviously we have very strong existing uh, uh, institutions that uh, are built on the strength of our intellectual property laws and rules. So there also have been, I think, some efforts uh, in some of the the dialogue that took place, especially in Bali, to uh, try to develop alternative ways for sharing technology. And uh, I'm not as familiar with those uh, discussions as, uh, as some people who might be here. So if, if others have comments to make on this, please join in. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, our last speaker for the session is a very distinguished economist. Uh, Mahmoud Al Gamal is our Baker Institute Will Clayton Fellow in International Economics. Uh, he's also the chairman of the Economics Department here at Rice, and he has uh, this distinction of holding our chair for Islamic Economics, Finance, and Management, uh, for which he has a worldwide renowned reputation uh, based on his writing and his very important book. Islamic Finance, Law, Economics, and Practice. Uh, 
Uh, I also had the great honor of uh, writing a book with Bakhmut over the last several years called Oil, Dollars, Debt, and Crises, The Global Curse of Black Gold. So let me put in a plug for the book. And uh, Mahmoud is going to talk today um, about financial imbalances and uh, the Middle East. Um, thanks, Amy. L let me start. I'll, I'll, I'll get quickly to um, a couple of minutes to why. Uh, I'm interested in the Middle East because that's where I come from, but uh, why the rest of the world is, uh, should be interested in the Middle East, uh, and in part motivating it by some of the work that Amy and I had done in that book that she just mentioned. Uh, but let me start at the end because that ties nicely with the previous presentation. Um, the, um, the theme I have in this paper uh, will focus on um, a potential industrialization of the Middle East in the sense of an increase in manufacturing that you added to GDP. Um, um, and the bottom line from uh, a panel study um, of all countries for which data is available is that uh, manufacturing per se is not the major culprit for CO2 emissions. Um, this, is, this is a very interesting sort of um, data mining exercise. Um, you get reported industrial uh, value added per GDP and you get reported manufacturing value added per GDP. And manufacturing value added is a part of industrial value added. Um, industrial includes also things like construction. So if you're, so I was wondering as I was hearing the last um, uh, paper, and I, I'd be, I think I, I didn't want to ask the question there, but you know, if, if you overbuilt a factory and therefore the carbon content of the factory is so humongous, do you involve that? Uh, they include that in the um, carbon content of the manufactured product that's then uh, shipped. And, and obviously, there will be great uh, disagreement over whether or not. And what if you built an eight-lane road that goes from that factory to the port instead of a four-lane road, which might have done just an equally good job? The reason I get to this is that um, when I talk about the Middle East, uh, the main uh, theme that I will start with is financial imbalances. Huge amounts of money that come into the Middle East that eventually stabilize uh, global markets both for energy and for um, um, uh, all other financial assets. And when all this money is coming in, even if certain countries, and right now Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, everybody's on an industrialization uh, plan, uh, the largest commissions are going to be made in construction. So uh, whether you're talking about education or industrialization, uh, ultimately most of the money will be spent on, on construction and the supporting sectors in cement and steel and so on, all of which are, are going to be uh, very uh, highly polluting industries. But let me get to the story. So uh, we saw also in the previous talk the, um, the rate of growth of, of global trade, um, especially uh, in the last couple of decades which um, gave us uh, a period of very high global economic growth, driven mostly uh, by exports from certain parts of the world, uh, mostly uh, Southeast Asia, um, and, uh, or East Asia and, and Southeast Asia, and imports mostly in the United States and the United, uh, United Kingdom. So uh, if we look at um, current account balances, you see these, the, the black line, the huge surplus um, uh, in the current accounts um, that um, East Asia would, would be uh, collecting. And of course, the mirror image of that, if I were to include the United States, will be a, a huge uh, current account deficit for the United States. This is the growth engine of the world right now. Some countries growing by exporting and then lending to other countries who borrow in order to import. This is the only growth model that we know right now. And when we had our big recession and we started recovering from it, guess what? Our imports started growing again. Asian exports started growing again. We don't know how to get out of that system. There was talk of a, a soft landing where China will learn to consume more internally and so on, but we haven't figured that out yet. We're still locked into the exact system that gave us the crisis. Chances are we just had a little blip and the crisis is still unfolding. The story that we tell in the book that Amy mentioned is pretty simple. 
we have a secular cycle in uh, real uh, GDP growth, which leads to uh, a cycle in, um, uh, in, in demand for energy. But of course, supply can only catch up um, at um, uh, slower rates than demand. And so we get occasional spikes in real prices. So what we have here is a series of real oil prices. And of course, the two biggest spikes that we all know about are in 79, and then most recently in 2008. And we know that both of these were followed by financial crises. And the story is, um, for the last crisis at least, is very simple. The world recognized the problem of financial imbalances, that China was saving to lend us so we can buy more from China so it can grow to export to us. And um, everybody was talking about this as um, Larry Summers called it, a balance of financial terrors. They can't do anything with their money except buy our bonds so they depress our interest rates so our companies can borrow cheaply and our consumers can borrow cheaply so we can keep buying from them. And so it went. But of course, once you get that spike in energy prices because supply can't catch up with demand, the money runs into the oil exporting countries. So you can see here the amount of money that was flowing out of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait alone was, um, as we were leading up to the crisis in 2006, 2007, was rivaling the amount of money that was flowing out of China. So that tipped the balance and led to the crisis. Now, there are two reasons that the Middle East was interested in industrializing. One of them um, uh, right now is uh, to learn from the experiences of countries that got over their, their previous crises. And the other is a more global one, which is to avoid this outflow of petrodollars the next time that oil prices spike. Okay, so one is, is sort of uh, built on, on, a, on a real economic story. And there we know how countries recovered from crises uh, in, in the recent past. So we have the famous Mexican um, peso crisis in the mid-1990s, and then the Asian flu crisis um, uh, a couple of years later. And we know how those countries recovered from their crises. They recovered by exporting manufactured goods. Uh, in the case of Mexico, NAFTA was one of the vehicles that allowed uh, this, this boost in exports of manufactured goods to North America, but also to the rest of the world. And of course, in the case of Asia, we know, um, we just saw the, that picture of, of the big spike in, in current account surpluses. But the interesting part of the story also is that um, if, if you look here at developing Asia's exports to the United States versus exports to the rest of the world, um, it is very clear that a big part of the Asian recovery from 97 onwards uh, was not just exporting to the United States. As a matter of fact, a lot of it was intra-Asia exports. So um, one way that you discover your competitive advantage and so on is first to trade within your region, then eventually you specialize and you collectively start exporting to the rest of the world. And if the Middle East were to follow this uh, example, then they would have to learn to uh, industrialize, trade among themselves first, find their co relative competitive advantages, and then start exporting to the rest of the world. Now, in, in, in this regard, it's important to uh, sort of uh, point to something that was, um, was mentioned earlier um, um, about you know, uh, the, 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 the trade, the trade um, uh, engine of growth. Um, the latest thought in, in economic development is that trade by itself is not an engine of growth. So um, in the 80s and early 90s, people were talking about export-oriented growth, but it's not so much exports uh, that, that will allow you to, to, to develop economically and to grow sustainably, but an increased value added in your exports, which comes with manufacturing. So exporting raw materials um, we're back to the 1960s view. Terms of trade eventually move against you. It's not a recipe for long-term uh, sustained growth. So um, you need um, a regional um, uh, industrialization plan, uh, in, especially also because um, uh, you need to find markets beyond the usual matured markets. The US and Western European economies are not gonna grow at the rates that they were growing uh, previously. So the model of Asia, um, first trading among themselves and then uh, uh, um, exporting to um, the OECD countries is not gonna be available any longer. 
Now, let's look at that um, Asian example. And, and, and China, of course, is leading the pack. What, what I'm showing here is manufacturing value added as a percentage of GDP. So China, um, of course, is leading the pack. And I'll show you the growth rates of manufacturing as well, where China is still continuing to lead. But then you have the laggards, Malaysia and Indonesia. This is the flying geese model of, of, um, of Asia, right? Japan was leading, uh, was the, the front goose, if you will. And then technologies will start going over to uh, uh, less and less developed countries as they subcontract, as their labor becomes more expensive. So you can see that Malaysia and Indonesia are pretty good examples for what countries in the Middle East who are here in the middle of this pack should have been doing over the last 10 to 20 years. Um, if we call countries that have uh, manufacturing to GDP ratios of 25 or above emerging economies, 15 to 25 pre-emerging, there's no reason why to choose these cutoff points except they seem to uh, describe these countries reasonably well. Um, and then below 15%, in this case, we have the um, the resource curse economies, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, Algeria is interesting because um, uh, when, when oil prices fell, manufacturing to GDP actually started making it into the pre-emerging markets, but then they focused so much on the energy sector that they uh, became, in a sense, the worst of the resource curse economies in, in this sample. Um, but if you look at countries that are not as blessed or cursed uh, with, with um, oil resources, um, you know, the Jordan, Egypt, even Turkey, Tunisia, Morocco, um, they never broke into that category of manufacturing that Malaysia and Indonesia reached. Um, the, um, the rates of growth, um, also you can see the Middle East rate of growth of manufacturing is pretty mediocre. It's, it's about the middle of the pack, whereas East Asia and Pacific is still leading, even though they already have the highest rates of manufacturing to GDP, they also have the highest rates of growth of manufacturing um, uh, GDP. Um, oh, that was the wrong. OK, so one of these graphs is mislabeled. That's my fault. I'll, uh, this is growth. One of these is mislabeled. OK, I'll just skip it, and I'll move on. Um, OK, so here is the story. The story of the flying geese uh, in East Asia, again, Japan industrialized before the other countries. Um, eventually, labor became too expensive. They started subcontracting with South Korea and so on, other neighbors. So technology starts to migrate over, and, and so on and so forth. And then eventually it goes to Malaysia, and now most recently to Indonesia. So um, intra-regional trade, um, and, and it was facilitated in part with the uh, revaluation of the yen um, in the mid-1980s that uh, made the Southeast uh, Asian economy is very competitive and therefore uh, allowed them to export to Japan first and then eventually they started exporting to the rest of the world. But the interesting thing is that this never happened in Asia. Uh, uh, I mean, th th this never happened in the Middle East. So you can see how the intra-regional growth of uh, trade in developing Asia continued until um, the, the latest uh, available data, whereas the Middle East basically stagnated uh, from the time that oil prices fell in the mid-1980s. Um, there have been attempts to enhance interregional industrialization, industrialization and trade. Two countries that tried to do it via bilateral uh, agreements were Egypt and Turkey. I should tell you that in the Middle East there are hundreds of bilateral and multilateral trade agreements, none of which have allowed interregional trade to grow, as we just saw in the previous uh, graph. But in the case of Egypt and Turkey, which is relatively recent, you do see a spike and Turkish exports to Egypt and, and Turkish imports from Egypt. But at the same time, it, it doesn't reflect into overall regional uh, increased uh, imports and exports. So even though um, uh, Egypt was exporting more to Turkey, and as a result, we see more uh, exports from Egypt to the Middle East, the imports uh, from the Middle East stagnate, and the same for Turkey. So, their version of integration is each country wants to be the Japan of the group, or each country wants to be the Germany of the group. Nobody wants to be um, you know, the Italy or the, or, the, or the Malaysia of the group. OK, so will they be able to get their act together to have enough interregional trade for all the countries to find their relative competitive advantages, then to be able to industrialize and export to the rest of the world? I'm not holding my breath. But let's just 
think about one of the arguments that people could use against that. And that argument could be that if you, if you industrialize, then you're going to increase uh, the carbon footprint of the region substantially. Now, what I'm showing here is um, just uh, raw carbon emissions for different parts of the world. And of course, we know East Asia will be uh, leading the pack. Um, but the Middle East relative to its GDP is actually um, a reasonably large polluter. Right? So the question is, if this region, and, and we know that a lot of the industrialization attempts, uh, say in Saudi Arabia, the infamous examples are all the aluminum smelters that they're bringing in. Um, is, that, is that going to be um, a net positive or a net negative for the rest of the world? Is it gonna absorb enough of the excess petrodollars during the next spike uh, in, in prices to um, justify the increased pollution? Um, who knows? But the important question is whether industrialization, if properly construed, necessarily implies an increase in carbon dioxide emissions. Okay, so that's the empirical question that I will ask now that uh, I hope will be relevant uh, to the previous talk and to be relevant uh, to, to the conference and the study as a whole, right? And in, in that sense, since the study is gonna be a cross-country panel study, it's not specific to the Middle East. The results are universal. They just say, if we look at all countries and we try to isolate the effect of increased manufacturing output, um, is increased manufacturing output necessarily tied to increased carbon dioxide emissions? Okay, that is the core question. And so, as I told you in the beginning, the empirical exercise rests on a very, very simple um, uh, um, uh, data mining exercise, which is to look at industrial value added versus manufacturing value added. The difference being um, um, electricity generation, um, um, uh, and, and construction uh, as, as the biggest um, the biggest polluters. Um, okay, so um, the data is basically 40 years worth of data uh, from the World Bank's uh, World Development Indicators, and I estimated um, two different models. I'll show you here the one that's in the paper that was distributed, which um, studies the acceleration in carbon dioxide emissions. So. What we're trying to predict uh, on the left-hand side is the rate of growth of carbon dioxide emissions. On the right-hand side, we have the lag of that rate of growth. So if you assume that uh, some country has a steady state growth in its carbon emissions, then um, and, 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 um, um, th that, that coefficient here will typically be significant. You know, if, if you're a country that's growing, that's building, uh, uh, it will continue to grow, but then, um, uh, we will also look at the rate of growth of electricity generation, rate of growth of GDP, um, the rate of growth of industrial value added, and the rate of growth of manufacturing value added. And I'll show you the results, whether or not we include the industrial value added, because what we're interested in is the coefficient of this manufacturing value added. And, and the way you would read it is if this coefficient is significant, then it says that an acceleration of the rate of manufacturing um, growth, so if, we were, if, if our manufacturing output was growing at 3%, and now we're thinking of making it grow at 4%, will that result in an acceleration in the rate of emissions of carbon dioxide? Okay, so an increase in the rate of growth will be an acceleration, and we're asking if there's an acceleration in CO2 emissions. And then also the, the, the the urbanization of the economy is, is one of the right-hand side variables. Now, I ran this also for levels, and I'll tell you what the results were for levels after I show you the results for acceleration, because we, you get cleaner results doing it this way, but the results doing it the other way are also interesting. Okay, so this is the full estimation. So what we're trying, and, and this is a dynamic panel estimation. So uh, we have in, in this sample, if we wanted data on all these things on the right-hand side, you get about 118 countries for which you have some data. It's, uh, it's not a completely balanced panel because there are missing data for various countries for various years, but uh, there are enough data for, for most countries in this subsample to, to get uh, uh, reliable estimates. And um, the interesting thing is this, the rate of growth of GDP 
um, the, the rate of growth of, of uh, carbon dioxide emissions um, is slightly negatively related to the past period's rate of growth. So that is driven in, in part by countries um, uh, like if you saw the um, what was happening, for instance, in Europe and Central Asia, right? The the, the rate at which they were they were uh, emitting was 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 going down. So. In general, countries that were already industrialized are the ones that are starting to cut down slightly. Um, but um, the interesting thing on the positive side is that um, industrial value added an, an acceleration of the rate of, of growth of industrial value added will lead to an acceleration in the rate of growth of CO2 emissions. And it's a very significant number, not only statistically, but also economically. So every 1% increase in industrial value added will, re will, will result in approximately 0.4% um, uh, acceleration of the uh, rate of carbon dioxide emissions. This is a very, very significant uh, effect. But if we condition on, on this effect of industrial value added growth acceleration, the manufacturing value added growth acceleration actually doesn't cause very much, um, uh, if, I mean, it's, it's, it's statistically insignificant, but, but the coefficient is actually negative. Okay, so countries that are accelerating their manufacturing are not necessarily accelerating uh, their carbon dioxide emissions. And this is not only, and if for those of you who are interested in the econometrics, you, uh, the model, is explaining um, uh, the data reasonably well. Um, it passes all the specification tests um, that are required for this type of dynamic panel analysis. The interesting thing is this, not, this is not just an artifact of including industrial value and say, yeah, you're conditioning on the larger, on the larger um, entity, which is industrial value added, and if you condition on that, then manufacturing value added by itself doesn't have an effect. No, if you take industrial value added out completely, manufacturing value added still doesn't have an effect, okay? So increasing manufacturing does not by itself, accelerating the rate of growth of manufacturing value added does not by itself lead to um, uh, acceleration in, in um, carbon dioxide emissions. Now, since the difference between industrial value added and manufacturing value added are things like construction, construction is the culprit, okay? So if China is, 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 is causing this, this humongous growth in carbon dioxide, I wouldn't necessarily look at manufacturing. I would look at all the roads and, and airports and so on that they're building as, as uh, potential uh, problems. If countries are overbuilding the infrastructure for their manufacturing sector, they will tend to be very large polluters. If they only build that infrastructure at the rate that's appropriate for the level of development, they probably would not be uh, gross polluters. Now, I told you, I'll, I'll tell you about the results that are not in the paper as well. If you do this in levels, so instead of doing it where these are all growth rates, you do them in levels, you get the following result, which is a little bit weaker. You get that when you include both industrial value added and manufacturing value added, an increase in manufacturing value added does not lead to an increase in carbon dioxide emissions in levels. But that if you take out industrial value added, the increase in manufacturing value added will lead to increased carbon emissions in levels, okay? So the stronger result, which is not contingent on whether or not you condition on the larger, on, 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 um, on, um, on, on industry value added, um, would, would only hold for acceleration, right? If you're looking in an increase in the growth rates, then it doesn't matter whether or not you include it. If you want to look at levels, and part of the explanation of this is that the only way you increase manufacturing value added is you require some construction of new factories and, and new facilities and roads in order to transport the manufactured goods and so on. So there will always be industri the, the rest of the industrial value added component will always grow in order for manufacturing value added to grow. So if you do it in levels, you'll always get this paradox where whether or not you condition on industrial value added will make a difference, but, but certainly the result uh, would still hold that once you condition on that part, um, uh, on, on, on the bigger part, the manufacturing by itself is not the culprit. Okay, so just to conclude, um, 
I don't know, for those of you who, who may have paid attention, and it's a region that I pay a lot of attention to, there are many Middle East countries that are very, very aggressively pursuing industrialization uh, policies, including uh, in part through their sovereign wealth funds, although most of these investments tend to be um, um, private equity type acquisitions of existing um, uh, manufacturing firms. Um, the big culprit, I would say, is the big push in infrastructure building, and we understand that from just the rent-seeking uh, behavior of, um, of investors. That's where the bigger commissions are going to be. Um, uh, and ultimately, uh, as I mentioned, I wouldn't be worried so much about these countries trying to pursue an industrialization policy in the sense of increasing the size of their manufacturing sector. I'll be concerned about them overbuilding, which they still are. That's it. Thank you. That's the other thing in contrast to um, being involved with, we do import uh, things like uh, clothing, but those have much lower carbon, embedded car carbon in them compared to heavy machinery. So I think, I think there's something really important to sort of sort this out and begin to get a quantitative way of uh, connecting the economics and the uh, carbon. And finally, the other thing that's, that's really interesting, with the life cycle assessment, you also don't just look at CO2. You look at uh, SO2, NOx, all these other things, and their health, ben their, their health impacts. So you can get a, a comprehensive view of the relationship between uh, the uh, evolution of an economy and the whole array of impacts, and then sort of look at the trade-offs between those. So it's, uh, there's a, and, and, but what we don't do in our community is then look at the economic aspects of those and try to look at the trade-offs between different uh, uh, types of industrial evolution. So good chance for us to all collaborate on that. It was mostly a comment. But I agree completely. I think it's the, the accounting exercise is, is nightmarish because um, how you depreciate um, this infrastructure capital that you built in order to be able to build the manufacturing plant, and then how do you depreciate the capital in the manufacturing plant itself, and then to account for the carbon content of that in the product that you exported. Pretty much can play with numbers and produce results that are either favoring to the exporting country or to the importing country, and then it becomes a political issue because it's based on assumptions, right? Well, we have had a very interesting day, covered an extremely wide range of uh, presentations and topics. You are a diehard audience, um, and uh, I hope we haven't worn you out today, because we'd like to see you all back tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, for our discussion about natural gas uh, and some of the other aspects of the study and our very interesting panel on the role of the EPA, which I 
think will prove to be a bit controversial in uh, today's political scene. So uh, I thank you all for your attendance today and our authors and presenters, thank you very much for very interesting presentations. And uh, to our members of the Energy Forum, uh, thank you not only for your support, your generous support, but for your input uh, throughout the three years we've been working on this study. It has made an immense difference. And uh, also, uh, again, a thanks to uh, ConocoPhillips for sponsoring this conference. And also, uh, for those of you who are here for lunch, we need to give a, a special thanks to Baker Botts because lunch was really outstandingly delicious. And uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you very much.